focus on my model, so we like to kind of keep on our schedule. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Mary Lewis. In a former life, I was with Goodwill, um, but I've left that, and now we are all volunteers with the Children's Hospital Historic uh, Clothing Group. So what you're going to see today will all be new to you. So how many of you have been to the vintage fashion shows in the past? Great. Now we've been to this group many times, but again, what you'll see today you haven't seen, and Joy was really excited about that, and so are we. Uh, just a little bit about children's. Um, they've had their uh, costume collection probably as long as Goodwill. They do have bargain boutiques, people bring donations to them, and then they're screened, and that's how we get some of the garments. The other way is people see the show, just like you today, and know that, that there is a, um, a collection and that goes out to the community and they, they want their family treasures as part of that. Um, we do charge a small fee, and just so you know, that goes to address uncompensated care at the hospital. We like to do these shows in the community. It allows us to talk about children's mission a little bit and let you know their history. And we have a special guest today around that. And of course, we love to talk about the history of fashion. So that's just a little bit about us. Our theme today um, is some enchanted evening, or if you'd like, a night to remember. We have pulled some of the most glamorous and glittery evening gowns and wraps from our collection. And I'd like you to just take one minute and just think back about some enchanted evening that you remember. You had to have at least one. Maybe many, depending on your predilection. Okay, so now that you have that thought in your mind, are you thinking perhaps about a prom? Maybe a prom night? Maybe? None of you went to the prom. Oh, <laughs> Here's a support group for people who did go. Um, perhaps you're thinking about a Ginger Rogers or a Fred Astaire favorite movie those wonderful movies with the, with the evening gowns that she wore. How about anybody thought about their wedding, their wedding night? Anybody? None of you are married. <laughs> or happily married. Or want to think about that. Have a party. An anniversary celebration. Joy, I'm a little worried about this. Group. I don't know what they do at night. How about you were thinking about your favorite TV program, watching them. Okay, so you get the, I think you get the gist of what you're going to see today, and probably much, much more. Uh, our wonderful photographer, if you haven't met him, uh, we love him dearly. His name is Steve Miller. Uh, he's one of Tacoma's finest firefighters, and he also is um, extraordinary with technology and cameras. So whenever Steve can join us, his wife models for us too. So that's just to introduce you to Steve. Now I'm going to introduce you to my first model. Her name is Linda. And we're going back over a hundred years, as you can imagine, by just taking one look at Linda. A single world word like cotillion can produce an image in our minds. We imagine a grand ballroom with highly polished floors, candelabra, and ornate sconces docking the walls and table. A uniform orchestra plays a Viennese waltz in three-quarter time, while elegantly dressed couples like Linda swirl across the floor. The dancers create a vision of a colorful cloud as they perform various figures. So it is 1908, and Linda um, is, is at her cotillion. Her gown is a combination of a soft blue silk jacquard 
with accents of ecru lace detailing an off-white bamboo motif. So as Linda walks closer, you might be able to take a look at that motif. The, the pin tucking across the bodice echoes the, deep, the decorative tucks on the sleeve, a lot of detail there. And then we think one of the most outstanding um, features of the dress is the back. As Linda walks by, you'll see that there are self-fabric rosette flowers at the center back, and they have that elegant finishing touch. She carries a fan, of course, very appropriate for the period, to allow for her flirtatious glances and, of course, comfort. And she said she would be happy to leave it down here in the room if anybody finds it's a little warm or close in here. To say this, uh, Linda is the belle of the ball is surely an understatement. Looking at our model, it is hard to imagine that at this time, the average wage was 22 cents per hour. Only 14% of homes had a bathtub. And most women only washed their hair once a month and used borax or egg yolks or shampoo. Or so the history books tell us, but not our own methods. So Linda, very lovely. Thank you so much. So did everybody get a chance to Well, I told you we were going to have a special guest, and this is our special guest, and I'm going to describe her for you and her story. Imagine this. You are a 33-year-old young mother of three small children. Your youngest five-year-old son, Willis, is gravely ill. And even with the financial resources available to you, there is no medical help to call on. It is 1898, and your son dies from inflammatory rheumatism. His death certificate termed it heart disease. What do you do? Well, if you're Anna Hare Kleiss, you work with other women in Seattle to find an answer. So anybody know about Anna Kleiss? And what do you know about Anna? Right. So she is our founder, if you will. So we always like to tell her story. But first, let's talk about her dress. And this, by the way, is Steve's lovely wife, Alice. Nice. Our genteel lady of society took tours of hospitals that had special facilities for children, and, and, and here we find her today. She wears a long gown, um, a day, probably day wear, in that, in that lovely color of coral. My notes on that. Okay. I don't want to miss any of the details, so I have to. It's a lovely coral silk dress that has a two layer effect. Again, sort of like Linda's. It has an undersleeve of cream handmade lace matching what is peeping out from that V neckline. Um, and it has that underskirt that we're dating is about 1918. So we jumped about 10 years from Linda. The, um, it's a, it, it is um, a boucle and silk crepe. Look at all the sweeps in the back that Alice is showing you. The cross draped skirt hints at a hobble design, but again, it's a, it takes a little plastic as craze. Um, and none, none of the covered buttons you see are functional. They are actual fastenings with hooks and eyes. I love the buttons. I mean, we, we keep saying we're going to count them, but we haven't gotten that far yet. But with, with Anna's uh, trips to a lot of ho children's hospitals back east, she was motivated um, to, to call together 23 of her affluent women friends, each of whom contributed $20 to establish a similar facility in Seattle, like she saw back east. In the first year, members voted to establish the lasting policy of accepting any child, regardless of race, religion, or parents' ability to pay, with the poor given first preference. And so you know that, again, now Children's Orthopedic Hospital has a longer title, but for simplicity's sake, that's what most of us refer to it as. 
It is still governed by an all-women board of trustees, and key to the hospital's development has been income raised by volunteers through their work in the hospital guilds. And we all know we're not a guild, but certainly the revenue, again, from our shows goes to the uncompensated care. So this is our lovely Anna Carlos. Thank you, Alice. Most of my models you'll recognize they've been here before. Um, but um, this is Darlene. In 1914, the New York Times wrote, quote, anyone can dance an old-fashioned waltz in a shoe that sags at the heel, pinches through the arch, and binds through the instep. But nobody can dance one of the modern dances in an uncomfortable shoe. So we these shoes take our breath away. One of the modern dances that the newspaper was referring to was the tango, a scandalous dance craze that had been imported from Argentina in the early 20th century. And a few, if any, could wear tango dance shoes like the way our Darlene does today. These black satin shoes have a three-inch bluey heel and are decorate. We're going to spend just a little bit more time than we usually do in shoes because these are so extraordinary. You won't probably see another pair for a long, long time. They have their decorated with silver, copper, and black beading. The most outstanding feature, of course, is the three bra, bra, bra bar strap button closure, which works its way up the ankle. We notice that all the buttons have been moved to allow for, shall we say, a more athletic ankle. Um, our whole bodies, of course, are bigger than women were at that time. The Tango Pump made its debut in the Sears catalog in 1915, and it cost $3. Our model looks very regal from head to toe wearing a crown-like velvet hat and a black satin and lace dress from the 19-teens period. And we must not forget her beautiful velvet purse, Darlene will be showing you that, with the beading and dobbles on it. And she, may she dance the night away in her picture-perfect shoes and ensemble. Thank you, Darlene. All right. Dancing with the Stars. Oh, now I see some hands. You're going to hear lots of things about dancing today, so you're going to love that. Here comes Jordan. How many of you have seen Jordan in the past and you can't believe how she's growing? <laughs> she is a young woman, truly. One of them, and we talked about again though, Darlene's shoes, same kind of period of time, and another popular trend in footwear is the ankle boot. In 1915, an ankle boot with buttons, like the ones Jordan wears, was the standard too. And that is where the similarities end between now and today. Most of you know, ankle boots are really trendy. Jordan wears a black velveteen button boot with her white long dress, so reminiscent of pictures of the time. So if you sort of been looking back at some of your ancestors, you probably all have seen these sort of pictures. The boots have a round toe and a two-inch stacked Cuban heel. The label inside of it is um, Knight Godfrey of Squim, Washington, so they're a local. And the Knight Godfrey hardware store served Squim for many decades in the late 19th and 20th centuries. Fashion books have this to say about the button boot. You can probably imagine what I'm about to read. The close fit of the correctly buttoned boot made the foot and ankle appear slim. Well, Jordan's leg is very slim anyway, operating almost like a corset for the foot, but there was no gain without pain. For once on, the tight boot had to stay on all day, and no adjustment was possible 
which caused innumerable aches and pains from pinching. So you can imagine how long it takes somebody to put those boots on and take them off. <laughs> um, we, Jordan is in the eighth grade, and a dress like this, the enchanted evening that we envisioned, was her eighth grade graduation. So it was very common for young women of the time to wear a white long dress at that, for that event. Same thing for the high school graduation or a wedding in the country. There wasn't much difference between those worn by young girls and women, and the main differences over time were the cut. Um, this one has a no, not a high neck, as you can see, more of a V neck, and this, the length of the sleeves and, and how long it was. So we gave this one about 19. Again, a little bit of a nautical look, and then she also has a crocheted purse. I'm going to ask Jordan to assist me. from the Sears catalog, and there is a whole page from 1915 of young girls about Jordan's age in lawn dresses. You can see they're pretty expensive. I think some of them are like two to three to even four dollars, um, <laughs> depending on. So anyway, as Jordan walks around, you can take a look at that. Uh, dress from my 20s. This is Kay. 
So this is what you think of a little bit more, I believe, with the flapper. You saw the beads, now you see the lace. The overall style of this dress is one we frequently see beaded. It is, it is done as a tabard of front and back panel of decorated fabric with an underlayer of side panels of something plainer. There's nothing plain on that dress, but uh, that's what the card says. In this case, lace, embroidery, and netting. It is some really lovely lace, and we believe it might have been a few shades lighter when it was new, but again, it's almost 100 years old, probably in the 24, 25 period, 1924, but it is now mellowed to a lovely cream shade that shows the tone-on-tone -tone embroidery very well. An example of the straight or chemise cut with just a bit of extra at the hip, in this case falling to asymmetric cords, and on one hip a bronze satin bow. Because the fabric is so sheer, you can see the underdress, which fortunately for us was attached and not lost over time, and it shows even more lace. Her purse, uh, purse lovers in the audience, uh, you know the name of Whiting and David, Davis? Whiting and Davis, it's a Whiting and Davis enamel mesh purse. That lovely closure, lots of Art Deco detailing there just on the purse alone. And of course we had to have the hat. I, even though it's the evening, I didn't want to have you not see, you saw Alice's fabulous hat, and now of course you see the cloche, um, favorite hat of the 20s, and that's um, her cloche. Now I said I was going to talk a little bit about dancers. This was a period of time of marathons, dance marathons. The name Alma Cummings not, may not mean anything to you, but in 1923 she achieved quite a feat and she became the first person to win the first U.S. dance marathon. And here's how she did it. She danced in a marathon at the Audubon Ballroom in New York City from March 31st to April 1st, 1923. She wore out six partners. She stayed on her feet for 27 hours, and she set a new world record. To maintain her energy, she ate fruit and nuts and drank near beer. <laughs> Cummings ascribed her success in the competition to her nine-year vegetarian diet. Thank you, Kay. Very beautiful. He went slung over the back of the chair, and that's why they did that technique. So somebody behind you in the opera could see where you uh, brought your clothing. And this coat probably was worn to the opera or other formal events. And of course, Sylvia loves the hood, so we, we asked her to leave it up as she came in, um, but she's later going to take that off. The padding in the shoulders and the large cap to the sleeves that are narrow closer to the wrist help us date the garment to about the mid-30s, as does the single button closure. We think the designer made a good decision to keep the line simple and just let the color and the velvet fabric carry this garment. Okay, so we should at least put that foot down and maybe unbutton it so you can see that underneath the coat, we have chosen a lovely winter white confection. It is, oh, again, we're staying in that lace mode. The low back is not so deep as to be scandalous, but deep enough to remind us of the fashion of the decade. So when we move to the thir to the 30s, the erogenous zone went to the back. So and you can see why. Again, from the 20s, when they, the skirts got so short that it was the leg, now in the 30s, it's the back. The tiers of lace with different levels of sheerness are offset by the long center panel that gives us a long lean silhouette. But as the mo as Sylvia moves, you can see the skirt was cut for dancing and lots of room to move. She's showing you and a lovely swirl. Sylvia, we're going to get a swirl. Oh, there she's swirling. Swirling, Sylvia. Um, and you might have noticed her lovely beaded bag. So whereas Kay's was an enamel mesh, this is a true beading. 
both the 20s and the 30s. And the last thing we wanted to mention was those lovely gloves. So somebody will kind of hold her hand up and you can see the bling on them. We just got those in about two months ago. I've never seen gloves like this, so we were pretty excited with that donation, that rhinestone inset. Her shoes, um, they're comfortable shoes. <laughs> they're not, they're, they're probably not quite period, but they're um, of a design that would have been worn for a fancy occasion, but they fit. And um, we have to be very careful with these long gowns. Okay. Oh, wow. Sylvia, thank you. Okay. This is our last model before we start our second round, and her, her nickname is Trace. So when you hear me say Trace, that is what she goes by. And again, more of the 30s. I'm thinking you went from Red Riding Hood to now the van. And it's 1936. And you see this breathtaking peach-colored marabou feathered evening jacket with its colorless neckline. Fully lined, it features the ever-popular medium-length sleeve, which allows her to show off her long evening gl gloves in the same feminine shade of peach. Um, Trace is now, she, she took off her jacket, and again, she is a charmeuse evening gown. It's and that low back, and the distinctive or an exceptional feature about this one, bias cut. So this was also bias cut, but this one really shows you what that means. Bias allows the garment to cling to the body, it stretches, um, and shows off all Trace's attributes, which she works very hard to maintain. I think she goes to the gym about two or three times a week, if not more. Um, and we love that button detail. We counted them, we think there's about a dozen fabric covered buttons. The shoes that she has are period, and they are a pale satin, open-toed dancing slipper. And that's the, the open-toed shoe was introduced in 1937, so that's why we thought we wanted you to see it. Traces, 1930s, yeah. Isn't it beautiful? She wears her color so well. Thank you, Trace. Um, is coming back again now from the 40s. She has this wonderful, extensive collection of military uniforms from the various decades. And whenever I can get a chance, I always ask Alice to wear one of her uniforms. And she is going to take the mic now. I ask her to tell us a love story that involves the uniform. So here goes. Okay, can you guess what service I am? Navy. Couldn't be because I've got this big officer eagle on my hand. <laughs> and no, I'm not missing my brim. This is called a brimless pancake hat. Actually, the nurses call it a halo hat. And you know why? Because they were angels. So they called their, their nurses angels in the Navy. Well, this is 1945. That's what this uniform is dated. And I'm wearing the overcoat today because the story has to do with foul weather, being on a ship. But everything back then in World War II was double-breasted. So you won't see the women today in the Navy wearing a double-breasted anything. So the coat is very heavy. I'd say it weighs about six pounds. <laughs> and I'm warm. <laughs> and as you can see, I have shoulder boards. And they are um, bullion gold. Aren't they beautiful? And I have the, um, this isn't what the Navy nurses wear today, but it's an acorn, anchor, and leaf on it. And it's very pretty, and I'll carry it around and let you look at it. But I'm going to have Mary help me take the coat off now. Um, I did some, some modeling for Alice in June, July? June. June. And I want you to know I wore a six pound cape. And it was, you could feel all six pounds of that. But it was fun. We had a lot of fun. It was a veterans conference. 
and of course I have my silk scarf with it. And then back when the war started, they issued the Navy Nurses Corday bags because they wanted to save the leather for the men. So this lovely Corday bag, and inside it says, for Navy use only. So I think that's kind of neat. Well, can you tell my uniform is double-breasted as well? It's beautiful, isn't it? And I'm wearing dark stockings. So you had a choice of either dark stockings or beige stockings. And um, it's a gorgeous uniform, and then I have my Navy nurse insignia, and the rank on my coat and on my uniform is Lieutenant Junior Gray, Lieutenant JG. A lot of you are nodding your head, so maybe maybe people learning the different ranks of different services. Well, the story I wanted to tell you about today, uh, the lady who wore this uniform was named Marjorie Morgan, and many of the nurses, Navy nurses, were stationed on hospital ships. Well, you know what they called the hospital ships in World War II? They had nicknames. They called them love boats, <laughs> the love ships. Well, that made sense, didn't it? Because, you know, you got a pretty young nurse and a wounded soldier. Oh my gosh, what happens? <laughs> ah, they fall in love. Well, this particular nurse was stationed on the hospital ship Relief, and they were in the Pacific picking up wounded, and um, uh, um, I'm sorry, um, <clears throat> prisoners of war, uh, men that were uh, just recently uh, in, you know, prisoners of war. So um, they were pretty busy. Well, not only did the nurses have to contend with living on a ship and all the work they had to do, they had to contend with the foul weather as well. So this one particular night, Marjorie was in her cabin, and a typhoon hit the ship. Well, she said the first wave hit them so hard that she flew across the room and hit the wall. Well, she shook her, stood up and shook herself off, and she said suddenly, this corpsman who'd been <coughs> harassing her during, out, during the trip came in and grabbed her. He wanted to check on her. Well, it tossed him around again. Another big wave hit the ship. So he grabbed a piece of rope and tied her to him. <laughs> and she said, we spent the night working on wounded, keeping everybody from getting totally seasick, tied together. I don't have to tell you what happened. They, they were tied together for 63 years. <laughs> Thank you so much. Washington State Convention Center for the opportunity of a lifetime. Although there were lengthy lines and long waits, people watching made the time go quickly. Where are we? Any guesses? Last August 2012. State Convention Center. That's okay, I'm going to tell you. Four volunteers from the Children's Hospital Vintage Program took part in the filming of the Antiques Roadshow in Seattle. Oh. To be aired in three parts, was aired in May of this past year. Our model wasn't there, but her entire ensemble from head to toe was, and this is what we learned from the experts. The black heavily accented long formal is from the early 40s and is in excellent condition. The soft lotus leaf type shoulder and peplum waist design indicate early decade. Although there is no label in the gown, um, the appraiser attributed to the designer Hattie Carn Carnegie or Nettie Rosenstein, both high fashion designers of the period, and he valued it at some $400 to $600. The very rare ladies' evening shoes, and Kate's going to have to pick up her dress so you can see the shoes. They're from the late 40s to the early, uh, excuse me, the early, the late 30s to the early 40s. I finally got it right. They're highly decorative and the jeweled heels. is a custom design from Paris. 
in the Art Deco style. He said the heels become the focal point of the shoe and are very collectible. The heel alone is valued at $300 to $350. So the shoe can be ruined, but people still want the heel. The materials are a Czech robin's egg blue beads and Austrian crystals. The value of the entire shoe is $500. It could go from $400 to $700 in an auction environment such as New York City. And then her evening hat is a Lily Dashe from the 30s. He attributed to a well-known designer of the period with a salon in New York City. And he thought rhinestone buttons might be Eisenberg. If you collect jewelry, you know what that means. And based on the brilliance of those, uh, the adornment on the top of her hat, he valued the hat from $400 to $450. So we call Kay our million dollar lady. <laughs> But simply put, she is wearing a real name-dropping showstopper, and our memories of this event are invaluable. We, P.S., we didn't stay for the feedback booth, so we will say it here. Thank you, Antique Roadshow. Yeah. <laughs> I went to an event, a fashion event with Kay last night, and I was telling her what she was going to wear, and I said, well, guess what one of your things are? And she said, the Antique. <laughs> but it's her dress, and you can see why. <coughs> Thank you, Kate. Okay, I'm going to bring Darlene um, back, and then this is going to follow. We start with Darlene. Now we're moving to the 50s. We have two things from the 40s, now two things from the 50s. Now, though, although the um, the the coat and matching dress is associated with the 60s. The trend to wear these began in the 1950s, as you can see. The Far East look was also very popular in that period, so we're going to show you two examples. So for Darlene's silhouette today, we call this sleek, sophisticated, and sexy. She is dressed for an evening on the town in her black silk brocade swing coat with deep cuffs which is lined in the same aqua-colored fabric as the dress underneath. The coat is reversible and can be worn with the aqua side out over the same dress, or another identical one that is made in the black brocade fashion fabric. So we, basically this ensemble has five pieces because it also has a self-fabric belt. So she's doing a quick change so you can see if she was to do sort of tone on tone, wear the aqua on the outside. Darlene has chosen a patent leather purse, and those are Darlene's wonderful spring later shoes, and we like them with this ensemble. And some of you know about spring laters. It's a patented design, and it's got a little piece of elastic that hugs your foot, and so when you're walking with that kind of shoe, it doesn't, your shoe, your foot doesn't uh, go out of them. It's attributed to Bess Levine, Maybe you saw that exhibit a couple years ago at BAM with the first lady shoes, Beth Levine, but she, she um, designed those. So that's Darlene, and of course she has a fabulous hat on, her feathered hat. This one is Linda, pretty similar. Oh, Darlene um, is from Hong Kong, I believe. And this one, though, it's um, a two-piece black silk and gold brocade street, street length sheath dress with short sleeves. Now, we're going to talk about the shoes, but as she's walking by, notice them. This is, again, the matching coat with the frog closures on the side, that Far East influence that they love both in the 50s and the 60s. She has, so we're darling, had five pieces. Linda has three, but she has matching shoes. So again, the one, the lady who had this ensemble obviously had the shoes made to match. And then, of course, we, we just got this hat in, and one of our dressers upstairs went to great lengths the other day to find the perfect cocktail hat. We think she accomplished it. So again, that beautiful little hat inside the coat feather. So both Darlene and Linda are perfectly dressed for the, we believe, the emerging at home, perhaps a cocktail party or something, maybe a little bit more festive. 
like these are our two ladies from the 50s with their lovely evening outfits on for your pleasure. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Diane.
This dress has the classic elegant features favored by a Jackie, by Jackie. And she loves sleeveless like Michelle Obama uh, in the sheath dress. It has these eye-catching full-length full length streamers, which would probably have been too bold for Jackie. She, she liked more simple designs. We added a little bling in that bracelet. We just loved it. It is not, it's, it's from the 30s, but obviously we can show it to you in this, uh, with this ensemble. And I can't, uh, oh, and then she has the shoes that we had the bling on too. You can see that blue side heel with the rhinestone. A little bit more about Cassini. Um, in 1960, he was considered, this is what the fashion books say, a second string American designer. But then he was tapped by Jackie Kennedy to, to design her European influenced wardrobe. She had been chastised for wearing expensive European designers, and so she was an uh, American designer was required. Jackie couldn't win for losing, um, in the sense of sometimes of her fashion style. Cassini became the first official White House fashion designer. The clothes were designed in collaboration with the First Lady. Jackie often looked at fashion magazines or got pictures of fashion uh, shows and then sketched what she wanted and then took it to Mr. Cassini, where he would replicate these designs using the same fabrics being used by the likes of Balenciaga and Givenchy. Now, I want to know how many of you, if you ever went out at night, which we're wondering about, <laughs> but you don't watch TV. Um, but you might have just read or play cards or listen to the radio. Um, how many of you wear this dress today? Well, only two. Now three. Okay. Well, maybe you would have worn it. How many of you would have worn it when you were in your 20s? Okay, now a lot. Okay. Well, you just don't think it's age appropriate. Okay. But it is, we feel, the reason I ask the question is we feel so timeless and elegant. And that's one of the things that sort of is a hallmark of vintage clothing. That and the fact that it's, it's stayed around for all these years. Okay, we love you in this dress. Thank you so much. Now, we couldn't do a, a show about some enchanted evening without having something from the boudoir. So first we're going to bring Jordan back. And this is probably the last time she will ever allow me to have her carry a doll. <laughs> Um, but I wanted to, to just show you this lovely nightgown, um, a young woman's nightgown. You can see it's just fitting her in the wing. When I first saw it in the collection, um, I immediately thought of Peter Pan and Wendy. Yes. Don't you? Don't you yes. see that? And that was appropriate because this is a design from that period of, of the turn of the century when the story first started. So here is Jordan in her very sheer, somewhat elaborate. How many of you are sewers? Cartridge pleating? You know that term, cartridge pleating? The pleats on the bodice and, and the shoulders is, is a very hard thing called cartridge pleating. I know this because I washed this garment two days ago. Not only that, but I ironed it for an hour. Uh, but it's worth it. I mean, look how lovely it is. But again, the detail, I don't think people wore it too often to bed, but, but again, it was obviously very, um, perhaps by some very special lady. We asked Jordan to also have underneath her, so she could just show you a glimpse of it, her a petticoat of the period. And it has, you probably have seen that beautiful pink color peek through. So again, all that detail. And then she's got one more thing that we told her she had to wear. And she still will do what we ask her to do. She's not a teenager quite yet. And that is her bloomers. They're there someplace. There they are. So she's also wearing bloomers. She might have worn all that to bed. It was, you know, no central heating. It was pretty cold. So we just wanted you to see, again, what a young lady would have worn, or if Wendy did, that marvelous enchanted evening with Peter Pan. Thank you, Jordan.
my last ensemble, I promised Joy um, that we were going to show a few things that we had just gotten in um, to, as with donations, and this is one of them. Layers and layers of nylon make an ultra-feminine pinois set in a pale peach shade that we call creamsicle. Remember creamsicle? <laughs> or is it a dreamsicle? Play on words. This lingerie was donat donated to us recently, within the last month, from our bargain boutique store, I believe in Kent. Today it makes its debut appearance a lovely, dreamy way to end the show. During the first 20 years of the century, lingerie accounted for a quarter of one's dress allowance. How many of you put aside that much money for your lingerie? <coughs> Some lady up here is saying, no, my husband's t-shirts are just fine. <laughs> how many times, have, how times have changed, but we know there's always a special occasion for such a luxury. And I prompted you in the beginning, because I thought some of you would be thinking about your wedding night or perhaps your anniversary, or a cruise where you might wear something like this. Or maybe in bed with a great romance novel. You know, you're just getting into the period, so you would put on your, your pen walk. Special features of this are the double layers of nylon on both the gown and the robe, and that charming, what is called lettuce leaf shawl collar, that edging, um, I'm told, is called lettuce. And if you, as, um, as Diane's sort of finishing her round, if you have garments in your closet and for some reason you aren't wearing them, please do remember us because somebody had this in their closet and again recently donated it to Kent and now it's going to be part of the permanent collection and we can show it to audiences like you. So dream on, Diane. <laughs> so I'm going to bring my models back down if they can make it down the stairs. Do we have any questions? that we can answer today. Any questions? Joy says they're beautiful. Okay, well I thought you might ask me about my dress. So real quickly, this also just came in in donations. Since I didn't go too much into the 70s, I just wanted you to see something that we attribute to that period. Kind of a little bit of the Beirut neckline and of course the brilliant um, furniture of, of um, lots of things and um, it's I envision somebody wearing this as a hostess gown you know again a lot of in-home entertainment my shoes the lady up front they are not period they are what, what am I 